marital affair. His successor is due to be announced tomorrow. The fact that Sir Peter was a regular visitor to the cabinet in this picture at the back of the group means that a security investigation into his affair is viewed as essential, privy as he was to the most secret information. Officials at the Ministry of Defence said there was a state of trauma within the building today, but they believe it is highly unlikely that Sir Peter leaked any of the secrets kept here. But Labour, who called for an inquiry, are pleased it's underway now. It was an indiscretion, but of course he is our senior military man. He's in charge of the Army, the Navy and Air Force. He's privy to all our secrets. And that's why we needed to have the inquiry, to make sure that none of the secrets have leaked out. It's an unusually sensitive time for the forces. Sir Peter's resignation hasn't made it any easier. Cutbacks are underway, more are likely later in the year, and disruption at the top of the military may weaken the fight against further reductions. It's one reason why there's a rush to fill the vacancy. One candidate is this man, Admiral Sir Jock Slater, the Vice Chief of the Defence Staff, seen as a flexible and energetic operator. The other favourite is General Sir Peter Inge, the head of the army, who fought hard against the worst of the cuts to his service, winning two modest reprieves. According to sources at the Ministry of Defence here tonight, one of those two men has been chosen already, but they won't say which. The Prime Minister and the Queen have given their approval, and there'll be an announcement in the morning. The hope is that this will end an unsettling scandal caused by a defence chief being described by some here tonight as quite simply a fool. David Shookman, BBC News. The Euro Disney theme park near Paris appears to have been saved from closure. The park lost more than £600 million in its first year and its parent company, Walt Disney, had threatened to withdraw funding at the end of this month. But bankers and Euro Disney shareholders are now considering a restructuring plan which would include a £700 million cash injection through new shares. Walt Disney will buy nearly half. The American group will also take no royalties for five years and the 60 banks which have lent to Euro Disney will waive interest payments for 18 months. Euro Disney says it hopes to start making a profit next year. very entertaining but the um, no commentary we'll go back to it later the conservative MP Sir George Gardner has beaten off a challenge to his leadership of the 92 group which consists of more than a hundred right-wing Tory backbenchers some members of the group had criticized Sir George for his attempt to make John Major promote more right-wing MPs to the cabinet but he was re-elected by a comfortable margin a constant irritant to Mr Major, now re-elected to continue his campaign for more right-wing policies and ministers. Sir George Gardner pledged loyalty, of course, but it was not total. We are essentially a loyalist grouping, and uh, that will continue as it has in the past. It's also our function to uh, try to advise the government to the best of our ability, and that we will do, and of course campaign to ensure that the government regains the popularity that it appears to have lost at the moment. The 92 group took its name from this Chelsea home, where founder members met in the 60s. These days, leading lights are dedicated to keeping the Thatcher flame ablaze. But the support of former ministers doesn't open every door. Sir George found a meeting with Mr Major suddenly cut short last month after his plans to call for a right-wing agenda were leaked. The right are now focusing on Douglas Hurd and his efforts to stop Britain's veto on European policy being weakened. Broad hints at revolt are being dropped. Sir George's views, the 92 group's views, and the majority of the party are very much at one, I would think, uh, with this, that we should stand firm on the blocking minority as it exists. Mr Major was with the Foreign Secretary at number 10 this evening, discussing the veto question and how to deal with it. The re-election of Sir George by a margin of two to one against a loyalty first challenger is a warning shot, a reminder of just how strong is the Eurosceptic streak on the back benches. Jeremy Vine, BBC News, Westminster. Well, now we can go back to Euro Disney, saved from closure today by a massive financial restructuring. For once, there's cause for celebration at Euro Disney, 
the theme park conceived on a grand scale with its state-of-the-art shows and rides will continue. The threat of bankruptcy and closure has been averted. The attractions at the site were built with no expense spared. The cost has crippled the company. As the number of visitors dropped because of the recession, losses increased. But shareholders were told at a meeting that the burden of carrying the £2 billion worth of debt is about to be eased. New shares are to be issued to help pay off the banks. Disney will cut its management fees and royalties. The good news is that it looks as if a financial restructuring um, is in the process of going through. Um, the outline plan was presented to shareholders today, but um, it needs the lenders, that's the bank's, approval. And at a news conference, some of the 60 banks involved, including Barclays, said they'd accept the plan. Others are sure to follow, even though it'll allow Euro Disney to pay less interest on the money loaned originally by the banks. Well, we still have to uh, see how, what kind of reply we will get in the days to come. But I would say the overall uh, reception was uh, positive. And an increase in bookings for Euro Disney holidays, reported by some travel agents, may help too the result of a decision to cut prices at the park. We've seen the average price of a Euro Disney short break fall from around £240 last year to just £190 this year. So there has been a dramatic drop in the cost of the holiday. But on an overcast winter's day, visitors are few and far between. Euro Disney still has to persuade people that Northern Europe is the right location for an all-year-round resort. The negotiations have been difficult, but a positive outcome always appeared likely. Failure would have cost the banks too much money and Disney too much lost prestige. Jonathan Charles, BBC News, Euro Disney. Bosnian Serbs and Muslims are negotiating over the future of Gorazda, a town which has been besieged by the Serbs for almost two years. The talks were witnessed by the BBC correspondent George Ekin, who was the first journalist to enter Gorazda for 12 months. Afterwards, he was held for a time by the Serbs, who tried to confiscate BBC cameras and tapes. Of the 65,000 people trapped in Gorishta, more than half are refugees from other areas who fled here when the Serbs took their hometowns. Their living conditions are the worst, as many as 50 men and women sharing the same overcrowded rooms. When the convoys don't get through, we eat nettles and grass, she says. Yeah. There's a resilience among the refugees who say they're better off than they were. They can wash now. Improvisation is the key. Homemade water wheels on the river Drina provide some power. The Serbs still shell Gorozda sporadically. In one week at the turn of the month, more than a thousand shooting or shelling incidents were recorded. Four in every ten houses are ruined or uninhabitable. In the hospital, 20 doctors do their best with what they have not enough of the basics. Our biggest problem is we're always running out of bandages, medicines and surgical instruments. In such circumstances, ordinary treatable diseases are claiming lives and there's been a sharp increase in the number of injuries caused by anti-personnel mines. For the last few weeks, the UNHCR estimates the people of Gorizda have been living on one-fifth of their basic needs. And until a few days ago, there'd been a gap of one month when no UN food convoys got through. Deliveries are getting in again, but UN workers say Serb checkpoints have been taking fuel, clothing and medicines from the convoys. At Ustipracha, no man's land outside the enclave, the Muslim deputy commander of Gorizda meets the Bosnian Serbs for negotiations. The proposed deal includes prisoner exchanges, repairs to Gorizda's water and electricity supplies, and free movement for civilians and convoys. But the Muslims would have to accept that the enclave will be cut off from any Muslim state. We won't leave Gorizda, we'll stay with our homes, says this Muslim, and we want all occupied territory to be liberated. If he means the Serbs handing back eastern Bosnia, that's not on offer. For now, the Serbs are offering negotiations on Gorishta's future, and they know that to an international community full of new hope for Bosnia, that looks like something positive. George Eakin, BBC News, Gorishta. 
Police in Gloucester have discovered a deep well at 25 Cromwell Street where they've already found nine bodies. The well is underneath the garden extension built by the owner of the house, Frederick West, who's been charged with eight murders. His wife, Rosemary West, has issued a statement criticising press coverage of the case. Gloucestershire police say the well is beneath the concrete of this, the rear extension of Frederick West's house. The police believe it could be anything up to 50 feet deep. We believe there is a well and it is under part of the extension of the house here at 25 Cromwell Street. What we will be doing is looking at that. If we need to explore that further, then we'll do that. From early this morning, specialist police officers returned to continue a third week of digging after a weekend rest day. They've been concentrating again on the cellar area. The police want to be certain no human remains are left in the house before they leave for other sites. At the front of the house, more cement has been pumped into the cellar area to secure the foundations weakened by the police digging. In some areas, officers have dug down nine feet. Rosemary West, Frederick West's second wife, was said in a statement today to have been deeply shocked and upset by what the police revealed to her after her arrest. Her solicitor has also criticised continuing press speculation as wildly inappropriate. Senior police officers are tonight still deciding whether to examine the well in detail. If they do, it's likely the concrete cap covering it will be broken open and a single police diver sent down the well sometime within the next few days. The police say their operations here will continue until at least the end of the week. Clarence Mitchell, BBC News, Gloucester. A woman who was severely injured in a car crash on the M3 motorway has been awarded record damages of nearly three and a half million pounds. Mrs Leung, who's 37 from Solihull, was paralysed from the neck down. Despite the size of the award, who, she asked, would want to live like her? Would you swap with me? Would you rather be like me? I give you every penny. President Clinton has opened the first job summit for the group of seven leading industrialised nations with an appeal for collective energy and ideas. Unemployment now stands at more than 20 million in the G7 countries. Finance and employment ministers will spend two days in Detroit working on a common programme for jobs. This is the first international summit dedicated to unemployment. Within the G7 countries, it said there are 20 million people without jobs. President Clinton described it as the biggest problem of our era and said the G7 nations had to address this challenge. None of us has all the answers. We are here because we have something to learn from each other and hopefully something to teach each other. We can all do better and if we work together, it is certain that all of our people will do better. Britain's approach has been to stress the need for changes in the workplace, making jobs more flexible, and so workers more attractive to employers. All of us are going to have to change, and all of us are going to have to have the kind of active labour market policy, policies which President Clinton and the British here uh, are very much agreed on. But other countries are talking about the need for a fresh approach to retraining programmes, ones that simply don't train workers simply to be thrown out of another job further down the road. The governments don't want to come up with a one-size-fits-all solution because of their different economic problems. But unless they come up with some recipe for job creation, this summit will be rightly derided as nothing more than an expensive seminar. Richard Quest, BBC News, at the Job Summit in Detroit. The President of the Board of Trade, Michael Heseltine, has announced that he's taking action to change the law on company insolvencies. It follows a court ruling that receivers have effectively just a fortnight to sell companies that have gone bust. For the 130 employees of Scheme Furniture near Newcastle, today's announcement is no arid legal matter. Their company went bust last Friday, and following a recent court judgment, it seemed the accountants now running the company would have a fortnight to find a new buyer or sack the staff. The restoration of the administrator's right to seek a buyer for as long as they think reasonable is welcome news. Well, this is exceedingly good news, uh, but let's remember, it's only put us back to where we should have been in the first place. But nevertheless, it is very good news because it takes away that time constraint and that pressure. 
A legal judgment following the collapse of Paramount Airlines ignited the current crisis. Administrators warned if they were given just a fortnight to sell a company, thousands of jobs would be lost. Around half of all companies that go into receivership, Leyland Trucks amongst them, have resumed trading under new management, but it takes time. Michael Hesseltine wants to restore the 50-50 chance of survival to companies in administration. The real object is to give the uh, receivers, the professionals who go into these companies, the chance to try and do a job of saving the companies. Uh, of course, it's a more complicated legislative process, but that is the purpose of it, to try and save jobs. At Thurnsco in South Yorkshire, the 140 staff of this garment factory, which went bust a fortnight ago, face another night of worry. They were due to be sacked tomorrow. Their administrator says he'll study Mr. Hesseltine's words overnight and let them know their fate in the morning. Peter Morgan, BBC News. In South Africa, the funeral has taken place of the BBC's Southern Africa correspondent, John Harrison, who was killed in a car crash five days ago while covering the crisis in Botswana. John Harrison, who was 48, took up his post in South Africa two years ago. He joined the BBC in 1983 as a political correspondent and became chief political correspondent five years later. His funeral today was held at St. Columbus Church in Johannesburg. Joining his wife, two sons and other family members at the service were colleagues from the BBC and many other media organizations. His colleague in South Africa, Fergal Keane, spoke of John's main trademarks his great energy, decency, and loyalty. At least 24 people are now known to have been killed after a collision between an oil tanker and a freighter near Turkey's Bosphorus Strait. At least 10 other crew members are missing. The vessels collided near the Black Sea entrance to the Bosphorus, blocking one of the world's busiest shipping lanes. The Turkish government has warned for a year that massively increased oil supplies through the Bosphorus from Russia could cause a disaster on this scale. The inferno began at midnight when a tanker laden with 100,000 tonnes of crude oil collided with a freighter ship. Both vessels ignited immediately, setting off a series of explosions. Firefighters battled the blaze through the night. At daybreak, the tanker was still on fire and drifting north towards the Black Sea. Greek and Cypriot officials have accused the Turkish government of reacting slowly to the tragedy. For their part, the Turks have warned of an environmental disaster. They say efforts to contain an oil slick are to be intensified, but that the human and ecological cost is likely to rise. Christopher Gunnis, BBC News. One in five preschool children has speech or learning difficulties, according to a survey by the Speech and Language Therapy Research Unit. That's more than expected. Experts believe high-tech toys may be partly to blame. This from our education correspondent, Wendy Jones. How are you? Modern toys may be high-tech, sophisticated and noisy, but there are doubts over whether they're really much good for children's language development. Speech therapists believe that toys like these may deter children from making the effort to speak. When you think about it, a little doll that doesn't talk, that you will hear a child trying to make those noises for the doll. They will go, wah, 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 and, and I want to be fed in little sort of cooey noises. If the toy technologically does that, then of course the child doesn't have to make the noises for the toy and doesn't have to use their imagination in the same way. Today's survey shows an increase in the number of young children with speech difficulties. Those who work with them believe there's a connection with changes in the style of children's play. They say toys which talk are no substitute for parents actually spending time talking to their children at their own level. However, any suggestion that talking toys might retard children's progress is rejected by the manufacturers. It's unlikely that uh, these sort of toys are, are detrimental to uh, child development in terms of their speech development and uh, a child should have a balanced diet of toys as such and not just uh, on one particular area. But with one in five young children now experiencing language problems, speech therapists believe that traditional toys and parental attention may still be best. Wendy Jones, BBC News. There'll be more on Newsnight on BBC Two at 10.30, but that's the nine o'clock news tonight. Good night.
evening. There was a security alert at Luton Airport this evening after a suspect package was discovered in the main terminal. Bomb squad officers carried out a controlled explosion. The terminal has now been reopened to the public and it's understood no flights have been cancelled. The wife of a Cambridgeshire man who went into a coma after an operation has sued for compensation. Pauline Glass says she needs the money to care for her husband Andrew after routine hospital treatment went seriously wrong. Sally Chidzoi reports. Andrew was 36 and doted on his wife and two children, Rachel and Kevin. While working as a double glazing fitter, a piece of wood penetrated about 12 inches into his abdomen but missed all vital organs. He pulled it out and called for help. At this stage, his life was not in danger. When he arrived at Addenbrooke's, the decision was made to explore and clean up the wound before stitching. He was put under a general anaesthetic and suffered a heart attack and brain damage. Sally Chidzoy, Look East, Cambridgeshire. Two NHS midwives who were disciplined for allowing a woman to have her baby in a birthing pool started their appeals against the decision today. The two claim they had no choice but to help college lecturer Valerie French from Sawbridge with as she gave birth to baby Molly last month. It was claimed the midwives pleaded with Mrs French to get out of the pool as the contractions got stronger but that she refused. The Eats Hearts NHS Trust says they contravened the authority's policy of not offering water births to mothers on safety grounds. Luton Town are playing West Ham in an FA Cup quarter-final at Upton Park tonight. If you don't want to know the latest score, look away now. And if you want to watch highlights of the match, they'll be on BBC One at 11.15 tonight. That's it from us. Now the National Weather Prospects with Penny Tranter. Good night. Good evening. It's been another very mild day across much of southern and eastern England. In fact, Kings Lynn has seen another very warm March day with temperatures as high as 17 degrees. But in many other places have also been into double figures around 11 to 15. But it is going to turn progressively cooler during the next day or so, all due to this cold front currently straddling more central parts of the country. Now that will be moving erratically southwards during tomorrow, very slow moving over southern England tomorrow afternoon, while that cooler air spreads in across the the rest of the country. Now the cold front at the moment is giving some rain over Northern Ireland, parts of Northern England and Northern Wales and as we go through the rest of the night we'll see that rain pushing further south into many southern and central parts of England and also Wales. Further north we'll see more in the way of sleet and snow showers over the Scottish mountains which will be drifting in the strong winds. Dry and clearer though in southern Scotland and northern England and parts of Northern Ireland by tomorrow morning and here we will see a frost as temperatures dip down to minus one. But further south where we see the cloud and rain temperatures probably no lower than around six to eight degrees. Tomorrow morning then over much of southern and central England and Wales starting off dull and grey, quite cloudy with further outbreaks of rain and drizzle, occasionally heavy particularly over the hills and coasts. A dry and brighter start over northern England and southern Scotland, but already a fair crop of wintry showers over the Scottish mountains, those turning increasingly to snow as we go through into the afternoon. And we'll see those wintry showers moving into northern England and northern Wales as we go into the afternoon, and also many parts of northern Ireland. But turning dry and brighter in many central and eastern parts of England later on in the day, but the rain very slow to clear from the south coast and the Channel Islands later on. Still temperatures into double figures in the south, around 11 to 12 degrees, but a very cold day as we go further north as we see those winds still coming in from a westerly direction. On Wednesday and Thursday, quite tight ice of ours indicating strong winds from the west or north, so showery in the north but dry and brighter in the south. Oh. The new series of Mastermind, Serious Pressure for Eggheads. News of Kathy's affair with Tom reaches their respective partners in the final episode of Take Me Home in 40 Minutes here on BBC One after a report by Jane Corbyn for Panorama.